We're a nation of animal lovers. Oh, I'm getting kisses now, am I? We donate millions of pounds to the people rescuing unwanted and badly treated pets. But as Christmas approaches, how do we know the animals in every sanctuary are being looked after properly? When you go in and find a new rabbit dead, it was just absolutely heartbreaking. After concerns are raised about one animal rescue centre, we go in undercover. Well, oh, this one smells strong. There's no water left in this one. It doesn't look too good. And a leading vet gives us his opinion. Would you be happy taking an animal there? Certainly not. Tonight we ask, can you have faith in your local animal rescue centre? There's a limit to what the RSPCA can, can do, and the scale is such that we are concerned. start of the day at this rescue center in Newport. Breakfast time for the animals in its care. They're like your own. You have to make it nice for them, don't you? That might be your approval. This is one of what's believed to be 268 sanctuaries in Wales that take in stray or unwanted animals and help find them new homes. Okay. <laughs> Some of these centers are names most of us will have heard of. Big charities like the RSPCA and Dogs Trust. Somebody's going to get an amazing cat with her. She's absolutely wonderful, aren't you? But in every corner of Wales, there are sanctuaries, many going unnoticed, which claim they're also making a difference to animals' lives. Many of them are, but with some, it's less clear. Jonna, are you coming out now? Come on, then. Jackie Taylor from Wrexham has looked after rabbits all her life. She volunteered at her local sanctuary for eight years. I really enjoyed it at the beginning. I would just go in and walk dogs, and the, the volunteers seemed nice. Jackie started looking after the rabbits there, and as the years pass and more animals were taken on, she says welfare standards slipped. Probably part way through when you realised that you were reporting things and nothing was getting done. You know, the fact that the place was dirty in a state, you tried your best to clean it up, but the absolute disregard for animals dying. How would you work with that? The sanctuary Jackie volunteered at is Capricorn Animal Rescue near Wrexham. It's popular, and last year brought in a quarter of a million pounds in donations and income. They look after approximately 350 animals, from cats, dogs and rabbits, to reptiles, birds and even farm animals. We're overflowing with rabbits, with ferrets. We've got more guinea pigs now than we've had for a long, long while. Mm -hmm. The charity's founder, Sheila Stewart, runs it with her son and regularly promotes the work she's doing with the animals in her care. Sanctuaries like Capricorn aren't regulated. Boarding kennels like this need a license because they're governed by the Animal Welfare Act. So too are breeders and come to mention it circuses. As for sanctuaries, well the act doesn't cover them, so they don't need a license. All 268 sanctuaries in Wales and many more across the UK operate under the radar. And this sometimes can be the result. In October this year, the owner of the Second Chance Horse Rescue Centre in Cornwall was banned from keeping equine animals for 10 years. You have sanctuaries where, unfortunately, by the time we or a local authority go in, we're talking about dead and dying, we're talking about very severe suffering. Claire Lawson from the RSPCA says that when animals are dead or dying, it's easier to prosecute. But she believes there's a hidden problem. The number of sanctuaries that we visit on a regular basis where there are problems suggests that the problem is relatively deep. Maybe a visit helps them raise the standard slightly, but it's going back and back again. And that's a tremendous pressure on our resources and the resources of a lot of our work organisations out there. In terms of the scale of the problem, as you see it, across animal sanctuaries around Wales, how great is it? 
It's significant enough for us to be talking to you and asking for regulation and campaigning hard for that. There's a limit to what the RSPCA can, can do, and the scale is such that we are concerned. The RSPCA says under existing law it's very difficult to bring prosecutions and that if sanctuaries were licensed it would be easier to police. Good girl. Look up. And it's not just a problem for the RSPCA. Alison Ling works for a sanctuary that runs a network of foster homes in South Wales for people to take in unwanted dogs. She's had to deal with the consequences of poor conditions at other rescue centres. We had one dog that came into us that had been kept in a crate for 23 hours a day, stacked on top of other dogs also in crates. Her welfare was really suffering. We did manage to get her into a foster home who later adopted her, but she was traumatised. And this was in a so-called sanctuary? Yeah, there are a lot of dogs out there in these tiny rescues. No one really knows what standards the, the rescues are maintaining. And so it's only when we get called in to help and to pick up the pieces that we see how bad certain rescues are. In North Wales, former volunteers at Capricorn Animal Rescue have been protesting outside its shop in Mould. Many say they were banned from the sanctuary after raising concerns. A petition was also set up showing more than 2,000 signatures and a website claims to expose the hidden truth of what Capricorn is really like. One of the volunteers who raised concerns is Vicky Savage. She started at Capricorn in June 2014 and says so she noticed very quickly that it had problems. They were having people clean the cattery out um, and they, they weren't using any disinfectant to clean the litter trays. So obviously if there's five cats in a pen and one of them's got a disease, if you're not keeping on top of the cleaning regime, that's going to spread right through the lot of them. And then we started seeing cats becoming sick and cats disappearing. And sometimes we'd be told that they were homed, but we'd find out later that they died. I realised that we were telling people that it was bad. They were, they were kind of shaking their head and saying, oh, well, we don't really believe you. So I started taking photographs. Vicky says she found this cat in one of the pens in the cattery. It was dead, and volunteers believed it was there for some time before being discovered. And it wasn't just the cats. When you go in and find a new rabbit dead, it was just absolutely heartbreaking. You were finding two, three, four a week dead. Vicky says she often told Mrs Stewart she had concerns about the welfare of the sanctuary's animals. I basically got told I've done this for 30 years, I know what I'm doing. Volunteers we've spoken to say the public wouldn't be able to spot some of the alleged welfare problems at Capricorn by simply passing through. So we decided to send in a volunteer undercover to investigate. So I met Sheila and she vaguely guided me around um, the different animals on her land, but mid-tour I was sort of left to my own devices. Our volunteer hasn't been given an induction or any formal training. Despite this, she's asked to get started in the cattery. I spent quite a lot of time cleaning them out and feeding them and sort of making sure that their trays were clean. This one smells strong. <coughs> We were washing bowls from each of the cat pens in the same water, and some of them were covered in feces, so that water was dirty, and we were still washing other cats' bowls in it. We moved on to the isolation room, which is a small room at the end of the pens. Oh, stand in here? Yeah. Why? Disinfectant. Okay. Our volunteer is also told to sanitise her hands between cages or wear gloves. Disinfected. The cattery's isolation room appears to house a mixture of poorly adult cats and litters of kittens. I started to clean out the kittens. Their eyes looked sort of weepy and where they hadn't yet been cleaned, they were climbing in their own mess. Their paws were sort of wet and damp with urine. Their stomachs were sort of plumpy and wet with urine also. And they left traces of feces on my hands. There was one particular cat that I was told by Sheila and the volunteer that 
it had come in because it had been starved almost to death. And I went to give it some water because its water bowl was empty. And when I filled it up, the cat drank and drank and drank. The cat drinks for two minutes. It's taken our volunteer and another four hours to clean out and feed 40 of the 60 cats on site. There appear to be around 350 animals at the rescue and few helpers or staff when our volunteer is there. Basically, throughout the day, it was me, Sheila, one volunteer, one dog walker, and her son, Rob. Back at the RSPCA's own rescue centre in Newport, I'm seeing how they run things. These are all the dogs that we care for and are filming at the moment. Kirsty Morgan is one of five staff at the sanctuary today, looking after 120 animals. As with all sanctuaries in Wales, there aren't any laws governing this place, but here they've drawn up their own strict standards. This is our isolation in the cattery. So this is where any poorly cats, they stay in here so that um, none of the healthy cats get any illnesses as well. It could be that they've got diarrhea, it could be that they're sneezing. Um, so we try and keep them in one area. It's just the same for all the cats in our rehoming. They still have their water bowl, they've still got all their bedding. And as you can see them from the outside, um, they still have all their toys and everything in there and their litter tray. So but isolation yeah. means isolation. They're kept apart from other cats. Yes. Animal welfare should be at the heart of every good sanctuary. But the RSPCA and other rescue centres in Wales say some are falling below expected standards. It is a skilled environment, particularly when you've got a range of species um, and a range of situations that animals will find themselves in that needs specialist care. Are there people out there running animal sanctuaries who don't know what they're doing? It's difficult to quantify, but we know there are some sanctuaries that are not running at the standard that we would all like, and that's why we're asking for regulation. At his surgery in Merthyr, vet Mike Jessop is doing the rounds of his temporary residence. So what do we think from there? Um, he's eaten some of his bedding on Monday. Black... He's worked as a vet for 30 years and is often called as an expert witness in animal welfare cases. So what does he look for? Are they cleaning properly? Is there signs of contamination with faeces? Is there enough food and water available? Those are the things that I would be looking at from a welfare position. Of course, people might say, well, these are rescue centres. People are doing their best to give them a better quality of life. Does it really matter if they aren't regulated? Well, the whole point of a rescue centre is to rescue the animals from poor welfare. If you're putting those animals back into poor welfare, then you're not rescuing them. You're actually prolonging their suffering and their welfare compromise. And that gives me huge concern. Back at Capricorn, how are the animals faring? The kittens appear to be dirty again. During her time at the sanctuary, our volunteer is rarely given instructions, but she checks on areas she hasn't been asked to cover and regularly spots animals that don't have water. No water left in this one. Let's have a look if they have any water in here. Well, there's two rabbits in this enclosure, and there's no water in their water feeder. We can't be sure how long these rabbits have been left without water, but when our volunteer pours some in a bowl, the rabbits crowd around us to drink. What about the chickens? I'd seen them the day before, and they didn't have any water. When I went today, I gave them water, and they just drank and drank and drank, like so much so that I had to fill the bowl again. Get it all the way to the top. The chickens drank for eight minutes. Hello. More kittens are kept inside the house. And the litter of six we saw in the isolation room are getting a bath in Mrs. Stewart's kitchen. Anyone who's got an extra pair of hands, let the kitten fall into it. Is it fire? Is it fire? Oh, it's not fire. It's the afternoon, and it looks like the litter trays are full in this shared area. 
Some of the pens inside the main cattery also appear dirty. In one of them, there are pools of diarrhoea. Our volunteer was asked to clean out and feed all 60 cats in the cattery, but she only had two hours. So at the end of the day, she lets Mrs. Stewart know some pens haven't been cleaned, including the one with diarrhoea on the floor. I've almost finished the cat. The two last pens I haven't, I haven't got to yet. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm back at Mike Jessup's surgery to get his opinion on what we filmed at Capricorn. These poor kittens should have somewhere to hide. All they can do is huddle together is their only defensive mechanism. Uh, and they should have uh, an area that they can crawl into and feel more secure. And that makes them more stressy, that makes them more uh, prone to infection and more difficult to shrug off infection. Back to the kittens. All six appeared to have wet legs and stomachs. It looks to me like that might be a diarrhoea. Certainly soiling around the back end is usually indicative of that. I would expect kittens with that sort of problem to be bathed every day. When your kittens eye looks sore. We've also seen cats in there which are closing their eyes partially. That would indicate that there's a high risk of conjunctivitis. And conjunctivitis in kittens would immediately raise the spectre of cat flu. Mrs. Stewart told us the kittens were washed every day and seen by a vet every other week. She also said the cages in the isolation room were adequate for the temporary housing of cats and had been approved by her vet and the RSPCA inspectors. Ooh, this one smells strong. <coughs> and what does Mike think of the rest of the cattery? I don't like this setup with these cats in such heavy concentration. They're at least four and five cats allocated to each of these zones. Uh, I would really be a little bit nervous if we went above two cats per uh, set up here. That's hugely soiled. That's an awful lot for these poor cats. They've been forced to toilet on top of toilet. They don't like doing that and that will be really stressful for them. be that thirsty is very unusual and for them to almost mob the water bowl as they're doing would cause me great concern that they're not getting access to sufficient fresh water. Eight minutes of drinking? That's very unusual. How uh, considerable are the concerns that you might raise about this place? Well some of the lack of water is truly concerning. I would be very very worried about the fact that these animals weren't having regular access to water and also aren't being kept clean enough. Those are the key areas that bother me with the footage I've seen. There's no water left in this one. Mrs. Stewart claims the rabbits are given water every morning and volunteers top this water up during the day. She says the shared cat area was cleaned on the day we filmed it and that some of the cats in there don't use the litter trays. She also says the chickens are checked twice a day. Many sanctuaries, including Capricorn, are also charities. So they have trustees who should be overseeing their activities. Vicky and another volunteer, Dan Rose, were members of Capricorn, and last year they decided to become trustees. This meant they could access the charity's records. It's consumed me, I'll be honest. That rescue's 10 minutes down the road and I can't sleep. Um, knowing what's going on down there, the more and more we got into it, the more we realised there was a lot more problems than initially anticipated. We wanted the bank account details. We wanted all of the accounts. The charity raised a quarter of a million pounds last year. That is, uh, that's a hell of a lot of money. It came to a head after they confronted Mrs Stewart about the way things were being run. In December last year, Vicky, Dan and ten other volunteers were banned from the site. We'd only been there about 20 minutes, half an hour. A load of police cars pulled up with blue lights flashing. 12, 13 volunteers were all removed from site that day. Dan and Vicky were later sent letters from a new set of trustees, which included Mrs Stewart, 
revoking their membership. Mrs Stewart says some volunteers were fraudulently posing as trustees and the police were called because they were disrupting the work at the sanctuary. Former volunteers say they also raise concerns about animal welfare with the RSPCA. I don't think that the RSPCA have done enough. They've been given videos of the conditions that the, the animals were living in. They've been given photographs of conditions that the animals were living in. And it's over a long period of time that these, these photographs and, and the information flow was there. But still, there's, there's not enough done. The RSPCA insists it does act on concerns, but under the existing law can only go so far. If someone raises a concern, you, you must be able to understand their frustration that nothing much appears to be happening. Of course, and they, we share their frustrations, hence why there's such a need for regulation, so we can, we can, um, we can, we can act as a society, we can act when, when there's a failing in a sanctuary. It's the sixth day our volunteer has seen the kittens and they're once again looking dirty. Our volunteer starts to clean the rest of the cattery and discovers it's even dirtier than before. She has another shock in store. As she goes into one pen, she finds a cat she thinks is sleeping. Um, I found a dead cat um, in pen once. Yeah. What should I do with him? Dad, I'll put him in a bin bag and take him up to the vets tonight. Okay. Does the vet like dispose of them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, which one was that? Titch. Four of the kittens are now missing from the litter of six. What's happened to them? Did they die? Yeah. All of, all, like I all went in this morning. We don't know. It's the next day, and as our volunteer walks into the sanctuary, she sees RSPCA officers are here on an unannounced visit. They've left behind an improvement notice, which the RSPCA says is used to raise animal welfare standards. But Mrs Stewart tells it differently. She says the officers wanted to help her disprove complaints made online by former volunteers. So he said, if I can take photographs of everything, then I can not only say yeah. I've been down there, but here's the proof what you're saying is not true. So that's what he did. And he took pictures? Yeah, yeah, he spent a couple of hours here. Yeah. So, you know, the chief is better sent him down to sh get evidence to shut that lot up. So instead of acting on the volunteers' concerns, she plans to sue them. Now we've got the RSPCA to say everything they say are lies, we're going to go after them for defamation and libel. Yeah. And they'll all be in court. The RSPCA says Mrs Stewart's claims are categorically untrue and that its only concern is the welfare of the animals at the site. We first filmed these pools of diarrhoea on Wednesday, again on Thursday, the day of the RSPCA's visit. They're still there on Friday. Despite our volunteer filming it over three days, Mrs Stewart maintains this is untrue and says the cat pens are clean more than once a day. Mrs Stewart tells our volunteer a vet doesn't yet know why four of these kittens died and therefore nobody should go into the isolation room but her. But then she says... You know the tabbies in the black and white, those four? Yeah. Have they? Yeah. She says she's rehomed three other kittens that were kept in the same room as those that died. It's a huge problem. Kittens have died in that facility just next door to these kittens that have been rehomed. They should have been held there for at least a fortnight to ensure there hadn't been any cross-contamination before they are even considered for rehoming. Mrs Stewart says the kittens were well-grown and fully vaccinated 
and after veterinary advice, they were cleared to be rehomed. Oh what about Titch's death? Mike says in a busy rescue centre, any animal's death should be investigated to rule out contagious disease. Mrs Stewart confirmed that Titch was taken to the vet to be disposed of and says he died of old age. The dirty conditions are also causing Mike serious concern. That's truly awful. Um, it shouldn't have been there for more than 10 minutes. To be there for three days is just awful. Now, from what you've seen of our footage, what are your overall thoughts? The problem is that they've overcrowded it. And as soon as you've overcrowded it, you're then repeating the mistakes of disease transfer, lack of hygiene, stress on the animals, all of which shouldn't be happening. If you had the authority, would you close this place down? I would question whether this place should keep going. And would you be happy taking an animal there? Certainly not. Mrs Stewart declined to be interviewed, but in a statement, she says she's dedicated 58 years of her life to caring for animals. The charity's received awards and is planning a new isolation unit and cat and kitten units. She claims the charity has one part-time member of staff and two volunteers on work schemes, plus up to 20 more volunteers. She also says unfounded allegations of overcrowding, deaths of animals being hidden and animals dying unnecessarily have been made over a period of 18 months to the RSPCA, but that no action has been taken against the sanctuary. The RSPCA has told us it's been aware of Capricorn Animal Rescue for many years, and has been working to improve welfare at the centre. But it says it can't comment further for legal reasons. The Welsh Government is being urged to introduce a new law, forcing rescue centres to be licensed, meaning regular inspections and a limit on the number of animals. The idea is that we would have a licensing system akin to breeding and boarding establishments, and that would be done through the local authority. And you would not be able to run a sanctuary without having got that license and satisfied a number of, of um, requirements. None of them would be a, a stretch for any, any you know, well-run sanctuary. The Welsh Government says it's working with animal charities, including the RSPCA, to introduce a voluntary code of practice for sanctuaries but some feel it should go further. The worry of the RSPCA is it'll be the good guys who sign up to the voluntary approach. It'll be the ones who are failing that won't. That's why we need this statutory underpinning. What we're calling for is a mechanism that to make sure that the highest standards are there in all animal sanctuaries throughout Wales. So that's what we're saying to the Welsh Government now. It's your call. Do what needs to be done. And if it's not a statutory basis, give us something else with teeth that will make sure that everybody's up to the highest standards of animal welfare. For former volunteers like Jackie and Vicky, fighting to improve conditions at sanctuaries such as Capricorn, a change in the law can't come too soon. It would give out the message to everybody that you can't abuse situations like that. And that, you know, and people get recognised for being good um, sanctuaries and good charities as well. That would be a dream. I mean, for them to go in and do checks and, you know, and make sure that they are being run correctly, I think would make a huge difference. It's the end of the day at the RSPCA sanctuary in Newport. Want you a water bottle? Yeah. Excuse me then. Your mum. Some TLC for these cats facing the prospect of a better future in a new home. But those people arguing for change say it's the only way this level of care can be guaranteed.